Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Ten words. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's in English. And below you've got the Hebrew and that is actually seven words. Ten English words, seven Hebrew words. Now, Genesis 1.1, it's historical. You get a lot of people, they're trying to compromise with science and this, that and the other, in my opinion, because nobody had these views until science came along and they've started manipulating, this is symbolic and so on. Genesis is historical narrative of the beginnings of the, of the uh, creation uh, right through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and so on, Israel into Israel and so on. It is history. The resurrection is history. And uh, so this is a narrative. And yes, some of Genesis, yes, is in a poetic form, but that doesn't mean it's not history. It's history in poetry. That's all it is. Don't get confused. And uh, it's seven words, God's first seven words of special revelation. So general revelation, I look out and I say, I can see God in the mountains. I was at the top of Everest and I see God. Uh, I see him in the stars. That is general revelation. And the holy word is special revelation, explicit revelation. Two different things, right? Now God's fingerprint is in those seven words. I'll show you later. And so when you understand this text properly and you reflect on it, it has incredible implications for the reader. And so many Christians are into such waffling nonsense because they're not looking at the implications of Genesis 1.1. So the text has got incredible implications. Oh, by the way, the God's, I'm going to show you God's fingerprint is in the text. So we've got the seven words. I'm going to show you how he's putting a fingerprint in there, among other places. The text has got this in implications philosophically, theologically. It enables you to discern all false worldviews that I can think of. And um, it is also scientifically correct. It's philosophically correct. It's scientifically correct. And it's just wonderful that since the Enlightenment and the upsurge of hu humanism and then Darwin coming in with his theory of evolution and the Christian move and the distrust of the Holy Word, the absolute irony is thanks to quantum physics, thanks to really advanced science, we're seeing scientist after scientist coming back to God. And it's not, you won't hear about this in any newspaper. You won't get it on any TV news because it's not the story. It's not what people want to hear. And uh, we can talk about that later or you can ask me and I'll send you an email with a list of all the Nobel Prize laureates, all the physicists, all the chemists and that of absolute stature, mathematicians who are coming to God through the latest understandings of science. But it's an untold story, totally untold story. We're going to look at a bit of it. It's the most important verse in the Bible, in my opinion, because if you, if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then stop reading it. Go read another book. Don't waste your time. And uh, the last point is, if you believe Genesis 1-1, you shouldn't have a problem with any other verse in Scripture. Oh, there's an axe floating on water. The Bible's rubbish. Really? Uh, sorry, let's go back to Genesis 1.1. God created the heavens and the earth and he can't make an axe float on water. He can't lift his son from the dead. He can't turn water to wine. Wake up wake up if God can create the heavens and the earth and everything we see down into the DNA into the quantum physics into everything going on the complexity is mind-boggling beautifully mind-boggling I love it oh I just love it as they get more complex it's just brilliant uh, to show the uh, unsearchable depths of God and these physicists are sitting there in absolute awe the people in the biology looking at DNA are in absolute awe. The information theorists are looking in DNA and they are in absolute awe. 
Bill Gates is sitting there and thinking, I wish I could write a program that works like that. And so on it goes. No, you believe this verse and you shouldn't have a problem. It's not logical. You should be able to trust the word of God. If it says it parted the water, friends, it parted the water. Uh, it wasn't three foot deep. If it was, there was a bigger miracle than God parting the water because, because Pharaoh and his chariots all drowned. Uh, three foot of water. No, I think it all came back and then it came back over them and it drowned them because what was being told was the truth of what happened. And a phenomenal miracle laid there. I can't go down that road. No. So the number seven, used spiritually in scripture, it represents three things can be in combinations. Completion, perfection, rest. When it's used spiritually, and it frequently is, by the way. So be very sensitized to seven of anything. If you see, for example, the seven churches in Revelation, know that you're looking at a perspective of the totality of the church in all history. That's why you've got seven of them, right? You must know immediately. Anybody who says it's, it's purely about seven churches that are now defunct, they're in cuckoo land. This is God writing this word, not a man. Everything is patterned and to give us information to take us to the end, right through the end. That's why when people are not looking at the Old Testament today, they go, well, it's, it's dusty, rusty, forget it. Let's get in the New Testament. Again, they are in cuckoo land. We've got to go to the beginning to look at the end properly. We've got to go to the end to look back and understand the beginning properly. It's like a loaf of bread. You've got to look at it from both ends to see the totality of the message that is occurring in Scripture. And it's a wonderful message, Lord. Praise your holy name. So you could go on and on and on. There's seven days in the week. Right? Oh, yes, yeah, just an accident. Phew. There's no accidents. Seven days, seven annual feasts from Leviticus, seven spirits of God, seven horns of eyes on the land, seven candlesticks, seven letters to seven churches, seven sealed judgments, seven bold judgments. All these things are happening. The, the sevens are popping up in Revelation. Why? Because Revelation's getting to the completion, the perfection, the end. So sevens are coming up, sevens are coming, seven is telling you, yep, we're moving, boy. This is coming towards the, the culmination of the story. The word seven, just out of curiosity, occurs actually 56 times seven times in my Bible. Interesting. So this seven's fingerprint then is very significant because it's in the very first verse of Scripture. And uh, it's seven words, but if you knew the Hebrew, you could look at the letters and you see, well, it's four times seven letters as well. Oh, that's a bit of a coincidence in Genesis 1.1. But uh, to fully understand the sevens, you need to know a little bit about the ancient Hebrew and Koine Greek languages. They didn't use separate alphabetic and numeric systems. The alphabetic letters like A, B, C, D, A would be one. Two. So if you did a financial transaction and you said, I'm going to give you two goats, you'd be using the letter, and you wrote, you'd be using the letter B. And in the context, they would know you're giving, you're not talking about B for Bs, you're talking about B for two. You understand? They'd know by the context. So the letters used in the right context, uh, context would become numbers. And you would add the letters up to get the totality of any number that you're trying to explain right? That's what was happening. That's how they work. By the way, God designed this. Understand this. This is one of the thing of men. <laughs> if you think that you're wrong. Have you ever wondered where language comes from evolution-wise? You need to think about it. Evolved? Language? Think about it. <laughs> we've got, I think we've got some DVDs on it. It's the most ridiculous concept ever out of interest. Think of all the implications. Oh, well, it's another thing. So the implication is, when you understand a little bit about this, that God designed the Hebrew alphabet and numbering system. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, you could think of a guy, um, a Palin. Um, 
I forget his first name, his name was Palin, he's dead now, but he was a Hebrew expert, um, I think he had a mathematical background, and he'd heard that Isaac Newton, who wrote more about the Bible than he ever wrote about science, so when these idiots say that anybody who th believes God can't be a scientist, they're now throwing away Isaac Newton, who they follow as acknowledged as probably the greatest scientist that ever lived. <laughs> but uh, Newton understood God underneath the formal lettering was laying patterns in there. And he knew this from rabbis, it goes right back into ancient days. So Newton used to study this and Palin knew he studied. Palin was not a believer, not at all. But since he was studying Hebrew and he was studying mathematics, he thought, you know what, I'm going to go to a Bible and see if Newton's on the track, right track. Where shall I start? Oh, I'll start with Genesis 1.1. And from his findings of Genesis 1.1, he spent 30, all the rest of his life switching to become a believer and dedicating his life to exposing the patterns that no, and his thesis was that no human being could create the patterns underneath the words. That was his mathematical thesis that he offered in to a, a scientific uh, academy of some sort of the day and it was never refuted. Nobody could refute it. He put it in for examination by unbelievers. Out of interest. So an implication we're going to see in these sevens that I'm about to show you, just a few of them, is for the sevens to work out, someone had to design the language and the letters to get the values that do what we do when we read it. And it wasn't a man. You understand what I'm telling you now, if you think about it. This wasn't, this wasn't an, a co coincidence. No, this was God. I can prove in another sermon, if any of you wish and you want to put your hands up and ask me, I'll prove to you by going to the Greek and the Hebrew, I will show you how God's fingerprint is on the underlying codes in both languages. There's certain ways I can do that. But nevertheless, here's Hebrew, here's Greek, 1500 BC Hebrew roughly, Greek 800 BC. Man was changing these alphabets. The Greeks changed their, their stuff. They were, first they were going from right to left, then they were going from left to right, then they went back, then some did this and some did that. Then Alexander the Great came along. Oh, how convenient. And uh, he conquered a massive amount of the world. How convenient for allowing the gospel to go out. And he got everybody on one language, coin a Greek. How convenient to communicate the gospel. Because not many people know Hebrew. So let's uh, own these uh, Jews that have become dispersed have forgotten Hebrew. How convenient. What they need to do is all ask their rabbis to write the Old Testament in Greek. <laughs> the Septuagint is written about 200 years before Christ. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, because there's all sorts of benefits that come from that. But uh, so the Hebrew then, you're looking at three columns and you can see the numbers going up to 900 and you can see the letters that would be in the Hebrew alphabet and Greek the same. So... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in Hebrew. When we go underneath those letters and those words, this is what we find. Well, obviously, there are seven biblical Hebrew words. Um, some say there are over 20 patterns. I'm just going to give you a few. 28 Hebrew letters, four times seven. The first, the middle, and the last letters, their value is 19 times seven. There is only one verb in the sentence, created. The values of the word created are 29 by seven. The first and the last letters of all seven words added together is 199 by seven. The first and last letters of the first and last words, 17 times seven. The three nouns, that would be God, heavens, and earth. The three nouns brought together their value, 777. Seven, seven. That is very significant, extremely significant if you understood uh, uh, numerology in scripture. It is... It takes the characteristic of the seven and it, it gives you as divine perfection of that thing. I'll take out the word divine because when it applies to God, it is divine. Where does it apply not to God that gives us the idea of someone who's evil? 
Well, six. Six is man. Six, man fell. Man's got sin. Who's the guy we're waiting for at the end times? No, he's the six, six, six man. Six, six, six is telling us that this entity, this person coming, is going to be the most evil man that has ever walked the earth. That's what the six, six means, symbolically. And it's another story, but just to give you a background here. There's hundreds of these sevens patterns. The thing is, is this just random then? <laughs> no, my sir. No, no, no. If we examine this further, you'll see these sevens have been placed there. They've been placed there, and that is what Palin understood as a mathematician. He knew how to calculate the probabilities of taking the number of letters, the frequency of occurrence, the amount of words in the language, putting it into maths, and knowing this is statistically improbable. And from that hypothesis, still as an unbeliever, he began moving on and on and on to actually validate the theory that he had. Remember, what I'm telling you is purely to show you he's got a fingerprint there, a fingerprint underneath. And only those who search out those things will see it, the fingerprint. And it doesn't matter if you don't see the fingerprint. I'm merely sharing it to you because I'm opening up Genesis 1.1. I couldn't care whether you believe it, like it, don't like it, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm showing you. I'm showing you what God, the Creator, did to bring that book in front of us by the Holy Spirit and what he must have done to the language in order to get all those sevens into the very first sentence you ever get in his holy word. So this is just a side, but I can't help telling you, because oh, I'm opening up Genesis 1-1, so let's do it properly. I just want to tell you that if you take the numerical values of the 28 letters, and you take the numerical value of the seven words, and then you apply them in this formula, Take the number of letters, the value, uh, no, the number of letters, actually the 28 letters, and the product of the letters, and the number of the words, and the product of the words, multiplying each of the values of the letters together, you end up with 3.1416 times 10 to the power of 17. It's a massive number. But the thing is that those first five digits are showing you the value of pi, a massive scientific constant. Hmm, interesting. Probably just a coincidence, of course. And it may be. On the other hand, it could be a divine fingerprint, possibly. Uh, who knows? But there's a very interesting thing I need to just alert you to. <clears throat> That's Genesis 1.1. If we were to go to John 1.1, just John 1.1 and Genesis 1.1, what would we get in John 1.1? I'm glad you asked. Because we take the Greek letters and we take the value of the Greek letters and we do the same formula that you saw on Genesis 1.1 and you end up with 2.7183 times 10 to the power of 40. It's a, again, it's a large number. What is that? Those first five digits. That's the value of E, another massive scientific constant uh, to enable you to do uh, Napierian logarithms. Hmm. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm merely sharing with you. You want to ask me? God doesn't do anything by accident. That's all I know. He's not random. He's not jazz. He's not all over the place. Who's the author? He is. Who authored it? Spirit through men. Is it perfect or him? It's perfect. Look for the patterns. It's interesting. Can't do anything with it, but I just thought I'd share it with you because it's true. You can check these things for yourselves. Okay, let's go to the text. We're going to go up on the surface text. And let's look at some philosophical and theological implications. Oh, well, we shouldn't look at philosophy. You're a twit. No, no, philosophy. Philo, love, Sophia, wisdom, truth. Do we love truth? I can tell you what separates one person from another when I dialogue about God with people of different faiths, different of people of different views. What separates them, and I'll pick it up very, very quickly, is do you love truth? You know, you go through something like this. Do you follow the Bible? Yes. Is the Bible your authority? Yes. Jehovah's Witness. Um, you know, and you go down, would you follow simple scriptures if they're plain? Yes and yes. Ten minutes into the conversation, they're breaking every rule they ever told you. Because they don't love truth. They love what they're told from Bethel. They elevate Bethel 
they don't elevate the word. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, philosophy's right if it's biblical. Just like with Darwin's origin of the species. Do you know there's not one page that tells you anything about an origin? Do you know that there's not one scientific fact except for natural selection, which we agree with, you know, selection of things that uh, in cold weather, something without fur will tend to die as opposed to something with fur, natural selection. Nobody's got a problem with that. That's scientific, provable. If you ask, well, what else did he tell us in all that, that book? You come and let me know. Let me know if you find anything else to do with science that Darwin put in that book that is valid. I mean, he himself said, if you can't find the fossils, my theory is dead. Um, sorry? Okay, well, we know we can't find the fossils, the intermediary fo fossils. They're missing. There should be millions of them. What are our scientists doing? Ignoring it, many of them. Why? Because of their worldview. It's got nothing to do with science. They're just not taking the conclusion of what, he, of what Darwin said. So we're going to have some conclusions now coming out of the text. And uh, in Romans, we're going to look at it later, but you see Paul saying, you know, that men would have known God by his power, his, eternal, his eternalness, and so on, through his invisible attributes that are, uh, you're, obeyed, um, uh, you're able to deduce them by looking at the natural world. And God will hold you accountable. You can say you didn't see God, you don't know God. He's not going to take it. He's going to say that you chose to blind yourself to what I've written in the skies and so on and so forth. These invisible attributes. Well, Genesis 1.1, if we can use our brains rigorously, it's telling us a lot of things about invisible attributes of God. First of all, our universe had a beginning. It wasn't eternal as science thought up to uh, recent times uh, that uh, it was uh, eternal. No, it had a beginning. The reason they resisted looking for a beginning was because, well, it sounds a bit like a Bible. Every time you see science going into an area where the output could validate the Bible, they resist totally exploiting that possibility and do everything they can to counter it until they cannot stop it anymore. So the, the idea of the flood, explaining where the fossils are and the way the geology looks? <laughs> no. no. There was no flood. There was no global flood. Oh, you're in Wales, you're looking at the Cambrian explosion. When did that happen? No, millions of years ago. Okay, great. What happened? All these species just came out of nowhere. Okay, where, oh, you got all the species. Where's the intermediary bones ahead of them? Oh, there are none. Okay, so what's your theory? No, our theory is these all must have jumped into existence from nowhere. And again, it's the most laughable theory. If you understand DNA and the building of life, you know this is a laughable theory to have. What would be a better theory? A better theory might be that there was actually a massive flood and it shifted everything. And these things you found were shifted in the flood and they deposited into rock. And it's not billions of years old. It was shifted in there. That would be a better theory. There's nobody putting their hand up from the camp. You've got to go to the people that are being ridiculed and accused of delusion who are privately and at their own expense doing research, not helped by a government, not helped by businesses, not helped by universities to show us ways of looking at these things. No, it had a beginning. And they had to agree with that. Although the Big Bang, I, I don't agree with the certain technicalities on the Big Bang, but what we're agreeing on that they've accomplished is there was a beginning. And uh, it came from nothing. They agree, science agrees with that. It came from nothing to something. They agree with that. It came from nothing to something. How? Well, the Bible is showing us in Genesis 1.1 when it came from God. God created. So it came from nothing. Now they agree, and we agree, by the way, let's be careful on this, that it came as a birth, it's uh, technically you call it ex nihilo in Latin, N-I-H-L-O, but it's, it's out of nothing. He spoke it. That's why God says he spoke this thing. He didn't have to go and get some materials that are outside time, space, matter, 
and bring it into, because he's outside time, space, matter. So to get that stuff, God is not time, space, matter. He had to speak in some way through who? Through the Logos, through the Word, through Jesus Christ, right? Through Jesus, the Word. He spoke the Word and it came into existence. John 1, 1 to 3, right? In the beginning, note that phrase, in the beginning, it's referring back to Genesis, was the word, this referring to Christ, Christ is the word of God that was spoken. And the word was with God and the word was God. How revolutionary was that? I'm surprised John could print this and not get killed. He was writing to Jews, <coughs> principally. He was in the beginning with God. If you check the Greek on that, it's implying he was pre-existent with God before the beginning. All things came into, begin, into being by him, who? The Word. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus Christ. In him was the life. What is science trying to find? The life. <laughs> it's brilliant. <clears throat> they've got the DNA, they've got the coding, they've got the systems. That's mind-boggling, it's mind-boggling. But, mind but we've got another question. How did it come to life? What, what engaged it into life? Don't know. But it wasn't God. We know that. We know it wasn't God. <clears throat> so here's the issue for the atheists, of course. It did, it, the Bible says, it doesn't say this, that from nothing came nothing by nothing. Now, anyone who understands philosophy and words will understand that that sentence is absolutely meaningless and illogical. Nothing is nothing. <clears throat> you will see articles by PhDs telling you, in the beginning, there was these waves and they were jumping. Uh, sorry, uh, that's not nothing. Get rid of the waves, now tell me what happened. Uh, in the beginning, there was, just prior, there was blah, blah, blah. Stop it. Take that away. Now tell me what happened. Now, I'm not putting words into scientists' mouths. They know what we know by looking back at creation. In the beginning was nothing, not something. It's very important scientifically. It can't have been something. It had to be nothing. Nothing to nothing by nothing. Uh, is this a scientific statement? I hold by it. I'm a scientist. There is no God, and that is correct. You can draw your own conclusion, but God is telling us, no, he was there. He was there. He produced it from the nothing. Uh, nothing means technically, of course, not anything. You know, if I did a circle and I said the middle of the circle is nothing, that's not nothing. That's just an image and you're using the word nothing, but it's very loose. It's not a circle, it's not a board, it's nothing. It's not even a thought. Nothing is nothing. Understand what they're telling us. It's true, it did come from nothing. But how did it get there? The Word, the living Word, Christ, spoke. And later, if you want, if, if you're happy with this, tell me afterwards if you're happy and I've got enough encouragement, I will take this to Christ and I will show you how this word comes into the DNA and the implications of that. So God created. It wasn't, because it, it's created, what does that mean? Well, it's not what evolution says. It's not purposeless, it's not aimless, and it's not chance. It's been designed. God is the answer to that fundamental question, which atheists ask, well, we are here. Why? Why isn't there nothing? Why didn't nothing that gets nothing keep creating nothing? I have no idea, but it's not God. Think of it. When you go home, I want you to think of things I'm putting up on here. These are very deep things and they are completely undermining the nonsense you are hearing of the alternatives of materialism. You know, there's no immaterial side, there's no God. It is, unfortunately, philosophical and scientific nonsense when you really think about it. 
So God is then what? Well, he's the cause. Now, again, I can't go into the proof of this, but if you're interested, you're really interested, I would actually give you certain literature and you can go and research this stuff. But he has to be, even the atheists would know, that if there was a cause, because of how it works with our environment and everything being created, and he's outside it, he has to be the uncaused cause, actually. And uh, because he's outside time, we, we've labelled a thing, we call it eternal. We call it eternal. It's a word for outside time. It's another dimension of life. We're going to go there one day. We're going to be in eternity. And then we'll know a bit more about the eternal. But it's not a long a period of time as a Mormon would think. Mormons think eternity is a long while. <laughs> Again, it's totally illogical. No, it's outside time. God created time. We only found that up recently in science. That is a created aspect. And you can't divide time up and up and up and up. There comes a point where you can't divide time anymore. It's got properties. Einstein and others uh, found these things out. So what God is, he's unbounded. He's outside the time that he created. He created the universe, which has time in it. And again, science will agree. The time couldn't have created the time. The time only came when it was created. So what created the time? Again, nothing. Nothing created the time. So we're beginning to see a few things about God from this and a few things that are a bit wonky. He's Elohim. It's called Elohim, actually, in the uh, Hebrew. And uh, that's hinting, because it's plural, a divine plurality. It doesn't prove the Trinity or anything. It's just hinting at it. But uh, the Holy Spirit pops up in verse 2, and then you read in John later on, if you were to research, it's telling you Christ was there, the Trinity is in everything. John Bexworth, who is now dead, wrote a book he analysed every scripture in the Bible and he looked at what God the Father does, what Jesus the Son does and what the Holy Spirit does. And he proved categorically with scriptural references for every occurrence in the Bible before he died that they all do together everything. You will find, in other words, nothing you can find the Father does that the Son hasn't done. Nothing that the Son has done that the Holy Spirit isn't, doesn't do. If you read about the resurrection, for example, you'll see the Father rose. He rose in from the dead. Then you see the Spirit rose in from the dead. Then you see Jesus prophesying to the uh, Pharisees before he died, and he said he would rise himself from the dead. I will raise myself, he said. And so on it goes, everything. Every attribute, every act, all of them. Trinity, over and over again. <clears throat> this God, of course, he has to be supernatural. That word that the atheist hates, it's supernatural. I mean, they're looking for something supernatural. It's called nothing. There's a nothing that's natural and there's a nothing that's supernatural. And the supernatural nothing created the natural nothing. No, there's a supernatural someone, something. And uh, so he has to be supernatural. He's outside of his creation. And he has to be immaterial. Again, materialism as a philosophy denies that anything is immaterial. They deny your mind is immaterial. They can't touch it, put it on a petri dish. You know, say you say, I feel sick. That picture sickens me. Oh, let's get the science out. Let's measure you. Let's see how you got the sickness. <laughs> you don't know. There's nothing can measure it. It's not material. Is your brain material? Absolutely. Can you chop it up in pieces? Absolutely. Can you chop the mind up in the pieces? That's a different proposition. We know there's a mind, of course. Later on in Scripture, we're told. He is supernaturally powerful, of course, to create everything we can see. He's got to be supernaturally powerful. Supernaturally intelligent. Well, just look at DNA and all the other science and all the creation and all the animals. <laughs> it's mind-blowing. And wise, he must be wise. More wise than any man. More wise than any atheist. More wise than any Christian, of course. He's the source and the giver of all life. All life would have come from him. Everything's material. And remember, he created immaterial things. So demons, angels, cherubs, there are many immaterial things that God created, but he made us in his image, right? Didn't he make us in his image? 
Well, he's immaterial. So if he's immaterial, then he must have probably planted something immaterial in us. The core of us, yes, the core, the spirit and the mind. In the mind and the spirit are immaterial. We're in the image of God. We are quantum leaps away from any animal or a rock. He's sovereign. Why is he sovereign? Because he created. This is what the atheists hate. It's not about the Bible, actually. You've got to get this understand. They'll fight the Bible, but the purpose is to defeat being a God. Because they know, as well as we do, that if there is a God, he has the right to set the rules. And Aldous Huxley and the other top atheists, are they admit it publicly. I don't care if there is a God. I want to do what I want to do. And I'm not letting any God tell me what to do. I like having five affairs going at once, sexual license and so on, as does the Marxists who are currently changing our culture to go into absolute chaos culturally. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to do the opposite of escaping from anybody who gives them any rules. This is leading to madness, of course. But so he's sovereign. He is sovereign, and that is what they really fight. But it's difficult to tell them straight off. You know, you, you can't, you've actually got to talk about it on things on their level um, and then bring it into the realities of what are you really fighting? He's the owner. Of course, they would know that as well. He would be the owner. That is correct. And he has a purpose. Well, he made it. He's all wise, all intelligent, very powerful. So he must have had a purpose. Yes, there would be a purpose, as we can see in the design of creatures and so on and so forth. The last one in this area. So he's, he, because he's all those things, he's the supreme lawgiver, and he would be the judge. Truth, worship, morals, ethics, sciences. Where do all the formulas come from? Anybody ever found a formula? You can pick it up, cut it in scissors. E, equal, e equals MC squared. Is that physical? No, your intangible mind conceived the concept of E equals MC squared. Then you went to the tangible world and found it validated what? The concept of E equals MC squared. Do you understand what I'm saying? Algebra that we go under torture. It's immaterial torture that materializes in our lives. I hate mathematics. Why am I doing this? You will learn it. It's good for you. The rules. Where do they come from? This is the problem again. It's nothing. And it creates order of rules. Where did the order of the rules come from? That's order. Not chaos. That is order. Do you know that in the scientific theory of the explosion, by the way, do you know when the earth was the most ordered? at the point of the explosion, at this big bang, this supposed big bang. And they've realized that the second law of uh, thermodynamics, and you know, we've got this issue of energy becomes wasted and it doesn't disappear, but it can't, it's not usable, it's not easy to use anymore. They know this has been going on, you know, the sun's gonna burn out and so on if we left it long enough, this type of thing. So they know that's happening, they know it's a law and they know it's irrefutable. But okay, Sorry, let me get this right. So something came out of nothing and it was the most ordered that it could have ever been and then it went into chaos. But hold it, doesn't everything in life show us that order does not come from chaos? Chaos creates chaos. Leave your garden alone for six weeks. You know, do any sort of experiment you like. It's going to degenerate, it's going to go into chaos. Leave your children. <laughs> don't have any order. Leave the order. Don't worry, they'll all come without your guiding. <laughs> God's morality and love will be written upon the heart, unseared heart and conscience of any being made in his image. We can deduce that if we're made in his image, which we see later on. Man is accountable to his maker first and foremost. This is for us. We need to look at this. And when we're talking about atheists, we need to be thinking of ourselves. We are accountable to our maker first and foremost. 
are we? And the beautiful thing is, if all these things are true, and God is he's all powerful, he's all done, he did it for a purpose, if he makes some promises in that special revelation, can he do them? Absolutely. Will he do them if he promised he's going to do them? Absolutely he will. It's a whole purpose. Has he got the power? Are you joking? Has he got the intelligence? Are you joking? Is there a power that can stop him? Are you joking? I've just done some things coming out of Genesis 1.1. The interesting thing is that these invisible attributes, God was speaking to Adam, right? He had special revelation. Adam and Eve. We don't know how many conversations they had, what they had. I mean, we do know that Enoch made a prophecy of the second coming of Christ and Enoch's in like the 10th generation since Adam. And where do you find that prophecy? You find it in the book of Jude. We get a reference in Jude saying, and Enoch said, and it says, Enoch of so many generations after Adam, he said, he's coming with his armies. So what I'm saying is, God's word was going out to Adam and their descendants at a point. So they not only had general revelation, he was actually giving them specific revelation as well. And then through the prophets, getting specific revelation too. But in the beginning, they were these invisible, we were looking at things that are invisible. So these words, in my opinion, are perfect and complete to do something else. Discern and reject all false belief systems. We won't go into all the details of this, you'll be able to take this away, but atheism says there's no God. Well, the problem is, according to Genesis 1-1, God exists, he was present in the beginning, he created the universe, the universe is not eternal, no spontaneous, purposeless Big Bang, it's just stupid. No, there must have been a God. We call God, a God. Agnosticism, I can't know if God exists. Well, God revealed himself to man through the creative works and his scriptures. So when you get, I want you to build some confidence on this. When you get six PhDs and they all agree on something to do with the science relating to a Bible or to the Bible itself, and they all agree it's nonsense, don't get uh, put in a corner by it. <laughs> no, come see me, come talk, come research. Generally speaking, they're just waffling. They're waffling over, and because they've got the PhDs, you're just in subjection, and the culture is saying it, so you're in subjection. You've got cult cultural problems, you've got peer problems, you've got TV, movies, papers, and everything. It's just bombing and bombing you with the culture of the day. No, no, no. You need to start thinking, step back, and come and talk among ourselves, and uh, we'll see very often it's utter hot air. They may not know it's hot air all the time. They're not all malicious, evil people because they're also listening to the culture. They were brought up in a university that taught the culture and so on. So they're products of the culture. So it's not all their fault. But it's very difficult and you've got to realise this. No, God reveals himself. I'll look at DNA. I will see the most complex systems. I am a systems guy. I understand information theory. 30 years working in the industry. I understand systems theory, I understand information theory, and I understand programming. I understand what hardware is, and I understand what software is. I know no piece of hardware. If I left it there for 20 trillion years, it will never write a program. So in other words, what am I saying? The physics and the chemistry don't write programs. They are hardware. It's where the software comes from. And in that software, the next thing I know is, I was writing in assembler originally back in the 1960s, late 1960s. And uh, you use coding systems, very complex. Anybody want to see some of my programs? Ask me sometime and I'll show you at home, I'll show you what I was writing. Yeah, it'll be giggly gooped to you. Because it's in a language, it's in a language with certain rules. And you've got to know the rules to make sense of the language. Do you know that DNA contains about three or four different coding systems? Where's a coding? That's like inventing an alphabet. Who would do something like that? Oh yeah, God. God could invent alphabets. But can chemicals invent an alphabet and then write programs that are more complex than anything any man ever wrote with self-correction routines, modules where it actually jumps off, pulls in other routines, can do repair? 
blah, blah, blah. Not a chance. I can tell you, I've been, I know exactly how these things work. There is no way. <clears throat> if you wanted to write a program in Assembler by chance to get a program, it's not going to happen. If you make one error, that program won't compile. So you make a little error in a bit of the coding, you run it into the computer, boom, error. <laughs> one error. In a trivial program, you could write a 10 line program. If you've done any little error in it, boom. <laughs> it's ludicrous, it's actually ludicrous. Dualism says good and evil are coexistent. But uh, God was on his own when he created, according to Genesis 1.1, and evil only came into being after his creative acts. So they're not good and evil, and they weren't eternally existent. Evolution says goo, eventually rocks and chemicals and whatever in a soup, uh, became you via the zoo. All the soup things you've been told are nonsense again, for certain chemical reasons. If you want the literature, I'll give it to you. But... Um, no, God created by distinct and instant creative acts. Adam was created speaking immediately. He didn't, God didn't create a baby and wait for him to grow up. He certainly didn't wait for an ape uh, to turn into Adam. Humanism. By the way, another scientific... Uh, known. This is known, but it's not being spoken about. The scientific community, many of them are too afraid, I'm not blaming them, to acknowledge they know... The greatest unknown thing that we know is running through all the scientists is that evolution is nonsense. They know it. But when they're paid by the government, paid by big business, paid by people with certain ideological swayings above them, are they going to put their head above the rampants? Because if you do it in a university, for example, you'll find you're kicked out of your tenure for daring to suggest creation. If you don't believe me, you need to, again, we've got studies showing you many people that can report what happens to you when you put your head up and say, isn't creation the way? It isn't all atheists doing this. It's the activists, the anti-theists, actually. They're anti-God. It's not an atheist ordinarily. You get an ordinary atheist, he's a good guy, he'll chat with you, he'll say, look, I hear what you're saying, but I can't really go with that. An, an anti-theist is spending his life trying to destroy Christianity on the internet, meetings, debates. Why? Didn't you believe there's no God? Yeah. And you agree there's no morals? Yeah. So in, and also, if everything's chemical movements, there's no truth? Yeah. Well, what the hell are you on the internet fighting for hours over somebody's opinion of truth? If you believe there's no truth, they can't live what they preach is another giveaway with atheists. They cannot live atheism. They talk atheism, but they live as if there's a God and there are morals and there is love. Imagine you come home from work one day. Hello, darling. I think it's time we procreate and um, you know, put our gene pool a bit further along the line because I've noticed my neighbor's got four kids. We need five. We need to dominate the gene pool. Um, do you love me? No, there's no such thing as love, darling. That is a, an illusion from chemicals. Oh, I'm so glad we had this touching discussion. <laughs> I'm moving next door to Fred. He doesn't know a lot, but he understands love. I'll see you later. You understand? Any woman should understand the foolishness of these things. The reality, they can't live it. Nishi, of course, complained. Nishi, the atheist. And he said quite outright, the, the dreadful thing I am doing is I am dispensing with a higher being to whom I could be accountable with real morals. And by doing that, I'm throwing away truth. I'm throwing away morals. I'm throwing away... And Nishi knew what he was doing. What happened to Nishi? He ended up in a mental home and then committed suicide. That's what atheists should be doing. Purposeless, aimless, pointless. Every time you get a problem, well, just bang. What does it matter? Or else go procreate. And why are you moaning at Islam? Why are you moaning at Islam? They go raping women. Yeah, that's procreation. That's what you say evolution's about. They're just procreating. No, but it's wrong. I'm sorry. There are no morals. And they're killing people. They're killing other DNA carriers so that their DNA will be superior to their DNA. So why are you moaning about ISIS? They're just doing what evolution says. 
logically what it's actually teaching. Think about it. Humanism, of course, is from the Enlightenment period and upwards. If you want to see how great humanism, look at the beginning when they went around killing people for no good reason in the Enlightenment. Started off with what? Massacres. It was massacring people. Hundreds, of, I think thousands actually. That, that inaugurated, you know, the French Revolution, the Enlightenment and so on. That was its inauguration. What are the characteristics of Satan? Steal, kill, destroy. <clears throat> the finite views of God, he created a space-time universe. Uh, so what this is, you've got people in the Christian community, you stay right away from them, you come to me if you need to debate with them. But they're talking about the thing that God doesn't know everything. He takes a bit of a gamble. So he tried out with Adam and he saw how it went. He thought, oh, Adam made a bit of a boo-boo there. I was hoping he wouldn't do that. So I'm going to bring in plan B. Then I'm going to watch things and I'm going to make a prophecy. And if, if it looks like it's not going to go on the prophecy, oh, whoops, I need to, I need to intervene. There are serious PhD theologians again taking these views. No, the, no. Time was created by God. He can't be limited by the thing he created. He's outside it. These things are a nonsense, actually. Materialism, well, God and his material universe, of course, are distinct. Genesis 1 1 is telling us that. Matter had a beginning, but God is eternal. Pantheism, everything is God. Well, I'll hold it. There's the universe of our reality, but he's outside the reality as the creator. Therefore, we can't all be one in God, as many claim. God and his creation are not the same. He transcends. Panentheism, all it says is that everything is in God. You know, I pick up my pencil, I'm holding God in the pencil and so on. <clears throat> Polytheism says there's multiple gods. Uh, you would get that with... Um, um, many uh, religions that will hold this type of view, but there's only one creator God. Genesis 1 1 tells us that. Did God give man evidences to back up his word? Because, okay, we got his word, we got the philosophy, okay, we hear, we hear what he's saying, we hear that if that was true, that's, yep, I'm, I can't fight what I've just said, the other person would be saying, but what's the evidences? I want more evidences. So did he give evidences? He gave incontrovertible evidence. Uh, from the beginning, through the special revelation of his prophets and his written word, and from God's general revelation by his material and immaterial creation. His glory is all over creation. So he gave man general revelation proofs of his invisible attributes from the very beginning. Because remember, when you're reading Genesis 1-1 in the Bible, that was uh, conveyed through Moses and written down we don't know exactly when it was written down, but it wouldn't have been written down the day Adam was uh, created, I would doubt. But the evidences were there from the moment Adam was created. Life, Adam's complexity, God, so on. So Romans 1, 18, 20, it talks about incontrovertible proofs, which is what I'm saying. You've got incontrovertible proofs of this invisible God. Romans 1, 18 to 20 is saying this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This wrath happens, we're in an age of evil, an evil age, according to the Apostle Paul. Paul. And so we see lots of extra problems that we needn't see because the wrath is not against the men. The wrath is against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness that they're doing. So when, when God allowed the Islam to go back after a hundred years and go into that place, it wasn't that he hated the people. He is responding to the evil by allowing it to continue. He's not making, he didn't send the Assyrians to Israel. He didn't send the ba Babylonians, you must go. They went because it was in their heart and they wanted to do it. <clears throat> God is not capable of evil. If anybody uh, is not sure of that, ask me to do a sermon on it. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, their conscience, the moral thing that is within all people, except those who have a very seared life. I mean, it's difficult when you bring up a Palestinian child, teach them to hold a gun, take a knife and slit the throat of their teddy bear, you know, the age of one and two and so on. You're searing their conscience. You're searing their ability to evaluate morally. But assuming you bring up uh, a child in a neutral, 
culture in a neutral zone, they will understand you shouldn't steal. You shouldn't bully. They know these things. They will know them. It's in our conscience. It's been written in there. But it can get seared. <clears throat> For since when the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, not unclearly, clearly, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Clearly seen? Yeah. Can you wake up before you were indoctrinated by our current culture? Can you go back 60 years and to a little child when the parent took him and said, look at that flower, how beautiful it is. God made that. What is that child's response? Awe. Awe. Now we have to climb to the top of a mountain to get any awe because we've been told, well, that's just a bunch of chemicals. It comes from the sun. It's got nothing to do with God. There's no awe in it at all. Look at that creature. Look how beautiful. No, that's got nothing in it. That's just this and this and this. There's nothing in that. So one thing Satan's been doing through the movement in our culture is to utterly destroy awe, real awe, and let us have awe for Marvel Man, Spider Man, whatever they are, Wimble the Wumble Band. I don't know what they are. But there's a whole host of them. All right? Now we're getting, wow. And we're getting not second rate, third rate, we're getting infinitely lower rate because we cannot even recognize what is around us anymore. And God is saying, you can say that, but I made that. And the more you examine it, you claim you've got the science that says this, that and the other and I didn't make it, I'll disprove your science, which is what's happening now. It's happening now. It's going to be great. The science is going to come back. I can see it coming. I don't know how long it's going to take. If the Lord doesn't tarry, uh, I can see science becoming more and more pro what that Bible says. They will be without excuse. So in, God is saying, I've given stuff there from the beginning. You can look at it. You can see the skies. And if you conclude that came from nothing, by nothing, to nothing, God is saying, wrong. And it's inexcusable that you would come up with such a ludicrous thing. You're coming up with that thing because you want to deny me. That's what's going on. God doesn't believe in atheists, right? You know, you go to God one day and you say, I, I want to be excused from everything because I didn't believe in you. I can assure you there'll be no one going into the judgment that will be able to sustain that argument of he never believed in them. <clears throat> it's funny how many people stop becoming atheists when... They go, they go in the military and they come under heavy fire and they know they're about to <laughs> do or die. Next thing you know, the guy's praying. I remember Ravi Zacharias went into a university full of philosophy students and their, their professors. The whole lot, everyone is against him. And they're moaning and mumbling and laughing and whatever. And uh, so he said, uh, would you mind, I just want to ask you a question. And I, if you won't do this, please don't engage in falsity. I want, to, I want you all to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you a question. And then depending on how you answer it, I want you to put your hand up. And uh, so they acknowledged they would. And the question was, do you actually think there is a God. Guess what? The majority of them put their hand up and answered him honestly. After everything they were doing, I actually think there is a God. That doesn't prove God. I'm just telling you how the nature of man, that's all. So the tangible proofs, where do you get them? In the heavens, the cosmos, uh, in the earth, of course, in man himself, his mind, his morals, conscience, in other creatures, great and small. You get them there. So they deny the anti-theists that there's any incontrovertible scientific proofs for Genesis 1.1. But uh, the anthropic principle is something that is <laughs> helping. It's only one thing. We could go on about a lot of things. But the anthropic principle is that uh, the universe, the cosmos, and the solar system, and the earth, and even actually down to man, have to be in certain ranges of constants, otherwise nothing would have happened. There'd be no life. You see, with quantum mechanics and that now, we're, uh, quantum physics, we're, we're making 
headways into understanding the underlying chemistries and physical attributes and the balances and what happens if you shift it by point no 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 one if you shift that thing what happens boom it's gone the whole thing's gone so they they're finding out um, in science that uh, there are these fundamental uh, constants and they have to fall within extremely narrow ranges lots of them otherwise there's no life there'll be no life and some of those constants are not here on the earth they're out in the cosmos there are things in the cosmos if they shifted point no life no life absolutely guaranteed so uh, the fact is that uh, someone like professor dawkins would say as an anti-theist he would say it certainly looks like we're fine tuned for life but we're not but he'll accept i cannot deny the evidence it certainly looks like we're fine tuned for life so there's no debate scientifically about this principle <clears throat> so strong and weak nuclear force constants gravitational electromagnetic blah blah radio of protons this is ratios now this is another interesting thing it's not just the characteristics of individual elements but their balance to each other has to be point no 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 so the balance between this thing that had to be within point no 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 and this other that had to be point no 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 then they got to be in a ratio together in a balance of point no 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 nothing works and uh, so you got these things i've put up i just want to tell you my dear friends i've given you eight and i'm being kind <laughs> I could put up another 85 necessarily precise cosmos constants constants which scientists agree if the fine tuning of those constants is not all these zeros no life then I could point you to another 154 solar constants in our solar system if they are not no life I don't know if you can understand <laughs> in other words in a nutshell we're nearly finished now but it's impossible to occur by chance um, what well, what was it then where's well, god wasn't it here's a physicist calculating i've just given you three things here's to give you the gist of it but i can't explain this in numbers that you can possibly understand but anyway he calculated the odds against the initial conditions being suitable in the cosmos for a star to form randomly right because it blew and there's no purpose there was no purpose it randomly came into the cosmos right that's what they they have to keep everything nothing can have a purpose you understand you can't give natural selection a purpose it has no purpose so what would be the odds of the, a suitable star formation it is a one chance in at least the opposing chances a thousand billion billion zeros one element that one element i mean if you're mathematical borel's law says that if anything is one chance with 10 and 50 zeros because of the age of the universe it could never have happened all right this is 1000 billion billion zeros he also calculated that a change in the strength of gravity or the weak force by merely 1 point in 10 raised to the 100th power so what he's talking about is a 1 the chances against are 1 with a zero 100 zeros behind it and the magnitude of let's give you an i i feel of this all the particles in the entire known universe would come to one would come to 10 with a 180 odd zeros behind it 180 that's all the particles in the universe atheists not christians atheists are writing some of these probabilities i haven't got it here i'm telling you now of certain chances in these factors one of them and he's a highly rep i think he might even be a nobel prize winner the odds he's got the number is so big to try and for us to conceive it he's trying to say imagine all the particles in the entire universe okay now you got a number it's like my you can't you can't really imagine it but they're there 
one with 10 and 183 zeros behind it. It's an unimaginable number. Imagine that every one of them had 10 <laughs> with thousands of zeros behind them, every one of the particles, to add to your understanding of the odds of this happening by chance. You're beginning to grasp the size of the numbers. You understand that if you took 52 playing cards and you shuffled them, that no one's ever shuffled that pack the way you have if you haven't deliberately cheated in any way? Do you know that? If you, take, you can do the maths at home. If you take 52 cards, shuffle them, no one in all history will have shuffled those cards and produced the pack that you produce. This is 52 by 51 by 50 by 49 by 4. Keep going down and multiplying the numbers and see the odds of you shuffling a pack and it was the same as the next person. That's 52 <laughs> These numbers. I mean, it's like doing that. You've got to do it you know, a million times in a row and keep, keep shuffling and get the same pack. And shuffling and get the same pack. Shuffling and get the same pack. I'm trying to get it into something you can understand. I hope this is building up your confidence that we have a marvellous God and he's doing these things to show even his love and mercy is towards the scientists, towards the atheists, towards the anti-theists. He loves them all. And he's giving them every chance to get out of the cultural, intellectual loop. You know that an intellectual, unfortunately, can be the biggest fool of all. You know when you get people that think too much? <laughs> they can be the biggest and most dangerous fools of all. Try reading Marx and others and see. There's three possibilities to explain Genesis 1 1. It's either law, chance, or design. I thought I'd spin this to get your attention. Law. There are no natural laws that can account for the fine tuning of the universe, the solar system, and the earth. This has been confirmed by the, what is considered to be the most uh, intelligent man on earth, Hawkins. Hawkins tried to find the formula that would, uh, some formula, which of course is not nothing. He's looking for a not nothing. But he wants to find a, not, uh, a something formula that would explain all other formulas. And we go, bing, it's not E equals MC squared. This is A or E for everything. Uh, and here's my formula and it explains everything. He has admitted there is no such formula. It cannot be according to uh, Godel's, uh, Godel's theorem, which is something else. Chance. The odds for fine-tuning, I hope I've just given you a hint with three or four. We've got 200 variables, and you know what's happening every month? Science is developing so fast that this anthropic principle has got out of hand for them. Because originally, back in the beginning, we were looking at about 20 items. 25, 30, 35, 40, 100, 150. And the man, one of the men who invented the idea of the anthropic principle, which was not Christian, they were atheists, he became a Christian because of his understanding of getting into the anthropic principle and watching how it's just getting worse and worse. And he said, I give up. There's no way this can be without a God and a designer. Design. A transcendent creator makes any sense, philosophically, scientifically, when you look at the wonders of the complexity of our universe. Exactly as Genesis 1-1 spells out in seven simple words. That's it. It's a complete and perfect proof for divine authorship of scripture. The divine fingerprints inside the text, it enables the rejection of all the false beliefs I can think of that are major about God. It enables us to logically deduce many of the invisible characteristics about our God. And there has never ever been any excuse for man to reject the evidences, which we've just spoken about a few of them. But in these end times, God is making his creator evidences more incontrovertible than ever. Where? Through the sciences that have been trying to refute him. It's brilliant. Keep it up, scientists. Keep it up. And uh, hallelujah for that. Not being published. And of course, you've got people that are coming. You see, because imagine how science would have progressed if it had said, that's God's word. I wonder how the earth started. Why don't we look at Genesis 1.1? Oh yeah, it says God created in the beginning. Okay, so centuries ago, they could have been saying it was in the beginning. It obviously would have spoken it out. It would have been an explosion. Let's get down in the formulas on it. No, 
Oh, no, 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 let's not get anywhere near that. That is that Bible mumbo-jumbo. We're not going anywhere near that. And the flood? Ah, oh, stupid, stupid. We're not going near a flood. We're going to listen to a geology, Charles Lyell. We're going to listen to him to get us to switch the view of geology right up and just prior to Darwin to this uniformitarianism. Lyle. Who was Lyle again? Oh, he's that lawyer. What was Darwin again? Oh, he was the guy who had a degree, not a very good one, in theology. We're going to turn all science on our head because of them? No. Time is going to prove that this was foolishness and the, why it was turned on its head had nothing to do with science. It had everything to do with giving a tool for the Huxleys of the world and others to do exactly what they want, when they want, with no moral constraints. I thank you, Lord, for your holy word, because without you, Lord, I could just as easily be on the other side of the fence, as it were. In fact, forgive me, Lord, for all those times in my youth when I used to debate people and try to tie them up in knots, and when I just try to refute their claims of the Bible and so on. I remember those days, Lord. Your truth will prevail. You will prevail. I just thank you, Lord, that when I look in Genesis 1-1, I can see so much, so much richness, so much an evidential proof of that very first statement. I thank you for it. I thank you for all of your holy word. And I pray that each and every one of us in this room will allow your word to work in our lives. Amen.